Track 31. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley. Of BigBible.org. Track 31. The Third Epoch. 10. Once out of sight of the church, I pressed forward briskly on my way to Knowlesbury. The road was, for the most part, straight and level. Whenever I looked back over it, I saw the two spies steadily following me. For the greater part of the way they kept at a safe distance behind, but once or twice quickened their pace, as if with the purpose of overtaking me, then stopped, consulted together, and fell back again to their former position. They had some special object evidently in view and they seemed to be hesitating or differing about the best means of accomplishing it. I could not guess exactly what their design might be, but I felt serious doubts of reaching Knowlesbury without some mischance happening to me on the way. These doubts were realised. I had just entered on a lonely part of the road with a sharp turn at some distance ahead, and had just concluded, calculating by time, that I must be getting near to the town, when suddenly I heard the steps of the men close behind me. Before I could look round, one of them, the man by whom I had been followed in London, passed rapidly on my left side, and hustled me with his shoulder. I had been more irritated by the manner in which he and his companion had dogged my steps all the way from old Wilmingham than I was myself aware of, and I unfortunately pushed the fellow away smartly with my open hand. He instantly shouted for help. His companion, the tall man in the gamekeeper's clothes, sprang to my right side and the next moment the two scoundrels held me pinioned between them in the middle of the road. The conviction that a trap had been laid for me, and the vexation of knowing that I had fallen into it, fortunately restrained me from making my position still worse by an unavailing struggle with the two men, one of whom would in all probability have been more than a match for me single-handed. I repressed the first natural movement by which I had attempted to shake them off, and looked about to see if there was any person nearby to whom I could appeal. A labourer was at work in an adjoining field, who must have witnessed all that had passed. I called to him to follow us to the town. He shook his head with stolid obstinacy, and walked away in the direction of a cottage which stood back from the high road. At the same time, the men who held me between them declared their intention of charging me with an assault. I was cool enough and wise enough now to make no opposition. "'Drop your hold on my arms,' I said, "'and I will go with you to the town.' The man in the gamekeeper's dress roughly refused, but the shorter man was sharp enough to look to consequences, and not to let his companion commit himself by unnecessary violence. He made a sign to the other, and I walked on between them with my arms free. We reached the turning in the road, and there close before us were the suburbs of Knowlesbury. One of the local policemen was walking along the path by the roadside. The men at once appealed to him. He replied that the magistrate was then sitting at the town hall and recommended that we should appear before him immediately. We went on to the town hall. The clerk made out a formal summons, and the charge was preferred against me, with the customary exaggeration and the customary perversions of the truth on such occasions. The magistrate, an ill-tempered man, with a sour enjoyment in the exercise of his own power, inquired if any one on or near the road had witnessed the assault, and greatly to my surprise the complainant admitted the presence of the labourer in the field. I was enlightened, however, as to the object of the admission by the magistrate's next words. He reminded me at once for the production of the witness, expressing at the same time his willingness to take bail for my reappearance, if I could produce one responsible surety to offer for it. If I had been known in the town, he would have liberated me on my own recognizances. But, as I was a total stranger, it was necessary that I should find responsible bail. The whole object of the stratagem was now disclosed to me. It had been so managed as to make a remand necessary in a town where I was a perfect stranger, and where I could not hope to get my liberty on bail. The remand merely extended over three days, until the next sitting of the magistrate. But in that time, while I was in confinement, Sir Percival might use any means he pleased to embarrass my future proceedings, perhaps to screen himself from detection altogether, without the slightest fear of any hindrance on my part. At the end of the three days the charge would no doubt be withdrawn, and the attendance of the witness would be perfectly useless. My indignation 
I may almost say my despair at this mischievous check on all further progress, so base and trifling in itself, and yet so disheartening and so serious in its probable results, quite unfitted me at first to reflect on the best means of extricating myself from the dilemma in which I now stood. I had the folly to call for writing materials, and to think privately of communicating my real position to the magistrate. The hopelessness and the imprudence of this proceeding failed to strike me before I had actually written the opening lines of the letter. It was not until I had pushed the paper away, not till I am ashamed to say I had almost allowed the vexation of my hopeless position to conquer me, that a course of action suddenly occurred to my mind, which Sir Percival had probably not anticipated, and which might set me free again in a few hours. I determined to communicate the situation in which I was placed to Mr. Dawson of Oak Lodge. I had visited this gentleman's house, it will be remembered, on the time of my first inquiries in the Blackwater Park neighbourhood, and I had presented to him a letter of introduction from Miss Halcombe, in which she recommended me to his friendly attention in the strongest terms. I now wrote, referring to this letter, and to what I had previously told Mr. Dawson of the delicate and dangerous nature of my inquiries. I had not revealed to him the truth about Laura having merely described my errand as being the utmost importance to private family interests with which Miss Halcombe was concerned. Using the same caution still, I now accounted for my presence at Knowlesbury in the same manner, and I put it to the doctor to say whether the trust reposed in me by a lady whom he well knew, and the hospitality I had myself received in his house, justified me or not in asking him to come to my assistance in a place where I was quite friendless. I obtained permission to hire a messenger to drive away at once with my letter in a conveyance which might be used to bring the doctor back immediately. Oak Lodge was on the Knowlesbury side of Blackwater. The man declared he could drive there in forty minutes, and could bring Mr. Dawson back in forty more. I directed him to follow the doctor wherever he might happen to be, if he was not at home, and then sat down to wait for the result with all the patience and all the hope that I could summon to help me. It was not quite half-past one when the messenger departed. Before half-past three he returned and brought the doctor with him. Mr. Dawson's kindness, and the delicacy with which he treated his prompt assistance, quite as a matter of course, almost overpowered me. The bail required was offered and accepted immediately. Before four o'clock on that afternoon I was again shaking hands warmly with the good old doctor, a free man again, in the streets of Knowlesbury. Mr. Dawson hospitably invited me to go back with him to Oak Lodge and to take up my quarters there for the night. I could only reply that my time was not my own, and I could only ask him to let me pay my visit in a few days, when I might repeat my thanks, and offer to him all the explanations which I felt to be only his due, but which I was not then in a position to make. We parted, with friendly assurances on both sides, and I turned my steps at once to Mr. Wandsworth's office in the High Street. Time was now of the last importance. The news of my being free on bail would reach Sir Percival to an absolute certainty before night. If the next few hours did not put me in a position to justify my worst fears, and to hold him helpless at my mercy, I might lose every inch of the ground I had gained, never to recover it again. The unscrupulous nature of the man, the local influence he possessed, the desperate peril of exposure with which my blindfold inquiries threatened him, all warned me to press on with positive discovery without the useless waste of a single minute. I had found time to think while I was waiting for Mr. Dawson's arrival, and I had well employed it. Certain portions of the conversation of the talkative old clerk, which had wearied me at the time, now recurred to my memory with a new significance, and a suspicion crossed my mind darkly, which had not occurred to me while I was in the vestry. On my way to Knowlesbury, I had only proposed to apply to Mr. Wansborough for information on the subject of Sir Percival's mother. My object was now to examine the duplicate register of Old Wilmingham Church. Mr. Winesborough was in his office when I inquired for him. He was a jovial, red-faced, easy-looking man, more like a country squire than a lawyer, and he seemed to be both surprised and amused by my application. He had heard of his father's copy of the register, but had not even seen it himself. It had never been inquired after, and it was, no doubt, in the strong-room, among other papers, that had not been disturbed since his father's death. It was a pity, Mr. Wandsborough said, that the old gentleman was not alive to hear his precious copy asked for at last. 
he would have ridden his favourite hobby harder than ever now. How had I come to hear of the copy? Was it through anybody in the town? I parried the question as well as I could. It was impossible at this stage of the investigation to be too cautious, and it was just as well not to let Mr. Wandsborough know prematurely that I had already examined the original register. I described myself, therefore, as pursuing a family inquiry, to the object of which every possible saving of time was of great importance. I was anxious to send certain particulars to London by that day's post, and one look at the duplicate register, paying, of course, the necessary fees, might supply what I required and save me a further journey to Old Birmingham. I added that, in the event of my subsequently requiring a copy of the original register, I should make application to Mr. Wandsworth's office to furnish me with the document. After this explanation, no objection was made to producing the copy. A clerk was sent to the strong-room, and after some delay returned with the volume. It was of exactly the same size as the volume in the vestry, the only difference being that the copy was more smartly bound. I took it with me to an unoccupied desk. My hands were trembling. My head was burning hot. I felt the necessity of concealing my agitation as well as I could from the persons around me in the room, before I ventured on opening the book. On the blank page at the beginning to which I first turned were traced some lines in faded ink. They contained these words. Copy of the marriage register of Welmingham Parish Church, executed under my orders and afterwards compared entry by entry with the original by myself. Signed, Robert Wandsborough, Vestry Clerk. Below this note there was a line added in another handwriting as follows. Extending from the 1st of January, 1800, to the 30th of June, 1815. I turned to the month of September, 1803. I found the marriage of the man whose Christian name was the same as my own. I found the double register of the marriages of the two brothers. And between these entries at the bottom of the page? Nothing. Not a vestige of the entry which recorded the marriage of Sir Felix Glyde and Cecilia Jane Elster in the register of the church. My heart gave a great bound, and throbbed as if it would stifle me. I looked again. I was afraid to believe the evidence of my own eyes. No, not a doubt the marriage was not there. The entries on the copy occupied exactly the same places on the page as the entries in the original. The last entry on one page recorded the marriage of the man with my Christian name. Below it there was a blank space, a space evidently left because it was too narrow to contain the entry of the marriages of the two brothers, which, in the copy, as in the original, occupy the top of the next page. That space told the whole story. There it must have remained in the church register from 1803, when the marriages had been solemnized and the copy had been made, to 1827, when Sir Percival appeared at Old Wilmingham. Here at Knowlesbury, was the chance of committing the forgery shown to me in the copy, and there at Old Wilmingham was the forgery committed in the register of the church. My head turned giddy. I held by the desk to keep myself from falling. Of all the suspicions which had struck me in relation to that desperate man, not one had been near the truth. The idea that he was not Sir Percival Glyde at all that he had no more claim to the baronetcy and to Blackwater Park than the poorest labourer who worked on the estate had never once occurred to my mind. At one time I had thought that he might be Anne Catherick's father. At another time I had thought that he might have been Anne Catherick's husband. The offence of which he was really guilty had been from first to last beyond the widest reach of my imagination. The paltry means by which the fraud had been effected, the magnitude and daring of the crime that it represented, the horror of the consequences involved in its discovery, overwhelmed me. Who could wonder now at the brute restlessness of the wretch's life, at his desperate alternations between abject duplicity and reckless violence, at the madness of guilty distrust, which had made him imprison Anne Catherick in the asylum, and had given him over to the vile conspiracy against his wife? on the bare suspicion that the one and the other knew his terrible secret. The disclosure of that secret might in past years have hanged him, might now transport him for life. The disclosure of that secret, even if the sufferers by his deception spared him the penalties of the law, 
would deprive him at one blow of the name, the rank, the estate, the whole social existence that he had usurped. This was the secret, and it was mine. A word from me, and house, lands, baronetcy were gone from him for ever. A word from me, and he was driven out into the world a nameless, penniless, friendless outcast. The man's whole future hung on my lips, and he knew it by this time as certainly as I did. That last thought steadied me. Interests far more precious than my own depended on the caution which must now guide my slightest actions. There was no possible treachery which Sir Percival might not attempt against me. In the danger and desperation of his position he would be staggered by no risks. He would recoil at no crime. He would literally hesitate at nothing to save himself. I considered for a minute. My first necessity was to secure positive evidence in writing of the discovery that I had just made, and in the event of any personal misadventure happening to me, to place that evidence beyond Sir Percival's reach. The copy of the register was surely to be safe in Mr. Wandsworth's strong-room, but the position of the original in the vestry was, as I had seen with my own eyes, anything but secure. In this emergency I resolved to return to the church, to apply again to the clerk, and to take the necessary extract from the register before I slept that night. I was not then aware that a legally certified copy was necessary, and that no document merely drawn out by myself could claim the proper importance as a proof. I was not aware of this, and my determination to keep my present proceedings a secret prevented me from asking any questions which might have procured the necessary information. My one anxiety was the anxiety to get back to old Wilmingham. I made the best excuses I could for the discomposure in my face and manner which Mr. Wandsborough had already noticed, laid the necessary fee on his table, arranged that I should write him in a day or two, and left the office, with my head in a whirl and my blood throbbing through my veins at fever heat. It was just getting dark. The idea occurred to me that I might be followed again and attacked on the high road. My walking-stick was a light one, of little or no use for purposes of defence. I stopped before leaving Knowlesbury, and bought a stout country cudgel, short and heavy in the head. With this homely weapon, if any one man tried to stop me, I was a match for him. If more than one attacked me, I could trust to my heels. In my school days I had been a noted runner and I had not wanted for practice since, in the latter time of my experience in Central America. I started from the town at a brisk pace, and kept in the middle of the road. A small misty rain was falling, and it was impossible for the first half of the way to make sure whether I was followed or not. But at the last half of my journey, when I supposed myself to be about two miles from the church, I saw a man run by me in the rain, and then heard the gate of a field by the roadside shut sharply. I kept straight on, with my cudgel ready in my hand, and my ears on the alert, and my eyes straining to see through the mist and the darkness. Before I had advanced a hundred yards, there was a rustling in the hedge on my right, and three men sprang out into the road. I drew aside on the instant to the footpath. The two foremost men were carried beyond me before they could check themselves. The third was as quick as lightning. He stopped, half-turned, and struck at me with his stick. The blow was aimed at hazard, and it was not a severe one. It fell on my left shoulder. I returned it heavily on his head. He staggered back and jostled his two companions, just as they were both rushing at me. This circumstance gave me a moment's start. I slipped by them and took to the middle of the road again at the top of my speed. The two unhurt men pursued me. They were both good runners. The road was smooth and level, and for the first five minutes or more I was conscious that I did not gain on them. It was perilous work to run for long in the darkness. I could barely see the dim black line of the hedges on either side, and any chance obstacle in the road would have thrown me down for a certainty. Ere long I felt the ground changing. It descended from the level at a turn, and then rose again beyond. Downhill the men rather gained on me, but uphill I began to distance them. The rapid regular thump of their feet grew fainter in my ear and I calculated by the sound that I was far enough in advance to take to the fields with a good chance of their passing me in the darkness. Diverging to the footpath, I made for the first break that I could guess at rather than see in the hedge. It proved to be a closed gate. 
I vaulted over, and finding myself in a field, kept across it steadily with my back to the road. I heard the men pass the gate still running, and then in a minute more heard one of them call to the other to come back. It was no matter what they did now, I was out of their sight and out of their hearing. I kept straight across the field, and, when I had reached the farther extremity of it, waited there for a minute to recover my breath. It was impossible to venture back to the road, but I was determined nevertheless to get to Old Wellmingham that evening. Neither moon nor stars appeared to guide me. I only knew that I had kept the wind and rain at my back on leaving Knowlesbury, and if I now kept them on my back still I might at least be certain of not advancing altogether in the wrong direction. Proceeding on this plan I crossed the country, meeting with no worse obstacles than hedges, ditches, and thickets, which every now and then obliged me to alter my course for a little while, until I found myself on a hillside, with the ground sloping away steeply before me. I descended to the bottom of the hollow, squeezed my way through a hedge, and got out into a lane. Having turned to the right on leaving the road, I now turned to the left, on the chance of regaining the line from which I had wandered. After following the muddy windings of the lane for ten minutes or more, I saw a cottage with a light in one of the windows. The garden gate was open to the lane, and I went in at once to inquire my way. Before I could knock at the door it was suddenly opened, and a man came running out with a lighted lantern in his hand. He stopped and held it up at the sight of me. We both started as we saw each other. My wanderings had led me to the outskirts of the village, and it had brought me out at the lower end of it. I was back at Old Wellmingham, and the man with the lantern was no other than my acquaintance of the morning, the parish clerk. His manner appeared to have altered strangely in the interval since I had last seen him. He looked suspicious and confused, his ruddy cheeks were deeply flushed, and his first words when he spoke were quite unintelligible to me. "'Where are the keys?' he asked. "'Have you taken them?' "'What keys?' I repeated. "'I have this moment come from Knowlesbury. What keys do you mean?' "'The keys to the vestry. Lord, save us and help us. What shall I do?' The keys are gone. Do you hear?" cried the old man, shaking the lantern at me in his agitation. The keys are gone. How? When? Who can have taken them? I don't know, said the clerk, staring about him wildly in the darkness. I have only just got back. I told you I had a long day's work this morning. I opened the door and shut the window down. It's open now. The window's open. Look, somebody's got in there and taken the keys. He turned to the casement window to show me that it was wide open. The door of the lantern came loose from its fastening, as he swayed it round, and the wind blew the candle out instantly. "'Get another light,' I said, and let's both of us go to the vestry together. Quick, quick!' I hurried him into the house. The treachery that I had every reason to expect, the treachery that might deprive me of every advantage I had gained, was at that moment perhaps in the process of accomplishment. My impatience to reach the church was so great that I could not remain inactive in the cottage while the clerk lit the lantern again. I walked out down the garden path into the lane. Before I had advanced ten paces a man approached me from the direction leading to the church. He spoke respectfully as we met. I could not see his face, but judging by his voice only, he was a perfect stranger to me. "'I beg your pardon, Sir Percival,' he began. I stopped him before he could say more. The darkness misleads you, I said. I am not Sir Percival. The man drew back directly. I thought it was my master, he muttered in a confused, doubtful way. You expected to meet your master here? I was told to wait in the lane. With that answer he retraced his steps. I looked back at the cottage and saw the clerk coming out, with the lantern lighted once more. I took the old man's arm to help him on the more quickly. We hastened down the lane, and passed the person who had accosted me. As well as I could see by the light of the lantern, he was a servant out of livery. "'Who's that?' whispered the clerk. "'Does he know anything about the keys?' "'We won't wait to ask him,' I replied. "'We will go down to the vestry first. The church was not visible, even by daytime, until the end of the lane was reached. As we mounted the rising ground which led to the building from that point, one of the village children, a boy, came close up to us, attracted by the light we carried, and recognized the clerk. "'I say, mister,' said the boy, pulling officiously at the clerk's coat. 
there be summat up yonder at the church i heerd and lock the door on hisself i heerd and strike a light wi a match the clerk trembled and leaned against me heavily come come i said encouragingly we are not too late we will catch the man whoever he is keep the lantern and follow me as fast as you can i mounted the hill rapidly the dark mass of the church tower was the first object i discerned dimly against the night sky as i turned aside to get round to the vestry i heard heavy footsteps close to me the servant had ascended to the church after us i don't mean any harm he said when i turned round on him i am only looking for my master the tones in which he spoke betrayed unmistakable fear I took no notice of him and went on the instant i turned the corner and came in view of the vestry i saw the lantern skylight of the roof brilliantly lit up from within it shone out with dazzling brightness against the murky starless sky i hurried through the churchyard to the door as i got near there was a strange smell stealing out of the damp night air i heard a snapping noise inside saw the light above go brighter and brighter a pane of glass cracked i ran to the door and put my hand on it the vestry was on fire before i could move before i could draw my breath after that discovery i was horror-struck by the heavy thump against the door from the inside i heard the key worked violently in the lock i heard a man's voice behind the door raised to a dreadful shrillness shrieking for help the servant who had followed me staggered back shuddering and dropped to his knees oh my god he said it's sir percival as the words passed his lips the clerk joined us and at the same moment there was another and last grating turn of the key in the lock lord have mercy on his soul said the old man he's doomed and dead he has hampered the lock i rushed to the door the one absorbing purpose that had filled all my thoughts that had controlled all my actions for weeks and weeks past vanished an instant from my mind all remembrance of the heartless injury the man's crimes had inflicted of the love the innocence the happiness he had pitilessly laid waste of the oath i had sworn in my own heart to summon him to the terrible reckoning that he deserved passed from my memory like a dream i remembered nothing but the horror of his situation i felt nothing but the natural human impulse to save him from a frightful death try the other door i shouted try the door into the church the locks hampered you're a dead man if you waste another moment on it there had been no renewed cry for help when the key was turned for the last time there was no sound now of any kind to give token that he was still alive i heard nothing but the quickening crackle of the flames and the sharp snap of the glass in the skylight above i looked round at my two companions the servant had risen to his feet he had taken the lantern and was holding it up vacantly at the door terror seemed to have struck him with downright idiocy he waited at my heels he followed me about when i moved like a dog the clerk sat crouched up on one of the tombstones shivering and moaning to himself the one moment in which i looked at them was enough to show me that they were both helpless hardly knowing what i did acting desperately on the first impulse that occurred to me i seized the servant and pushed him against the vestry wall stoop i said and hold by the stones i'm going to climb over you to the roof i'm going to break the skylight and give him some air the man trembled from head to foot but he held firm i got on his back with my cudgel in my mouth seized the parapet with both hands and was instantly on the roof in a frantic hurry and agitation of the moment it never struck me that i might let out the flame instead of letting in the air i struck at the skylight and battered in the cracked loosened glass with a blow the fire leapt out like a wild beast from its lair if the wind had not chanced in the position i occupied to send it away from me my exertions might have ended then and there i crouched on the roof as the smoke poured above me with the flame the gleams and flashes of the light showed me the servant's face staring up vacantly under the wall the clerk risen to his feet on the tombstone wringing his hands in despair and the scanty population of the village haggard men and terrified women clustered beyond in the churchyard all appearing and disappearing in the red of the dreadful glare in the black of the choking smoke and the man beneath my feet the man suffocating burning dying so near us all so utterly beyond our reach the thought half maddened me i lowered myself from the roof by my hands and dropped to the ground 
the key of the church i shouted to the clerk we must try it that way we may save him yet if we can burst open the inner door no 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 cried the old man no hope the church key and the vestry key are on the same ring both inside there oh sir he's past saving he's dust and ashes by this time they'll see the fire from the town said a voice from among the men behind me there's an injun in the town they'll save the church i called to that man he had his wits about him i called to him to come and speak to me it would be a quarter of an hour at least before the town could reach us the horror of remaining inactive all that time was more than i could face in defiance of my own reason i persuaded myself that the doomed and lost wretch in the vestry might still be lying senseless on the floor might not be dead yet if we broke open the door might we save him i knew the strength of the heavy oak i knew the thickness of the nailed oak i knew the hopelessness of assailing the one and the other by ordinary means but surely there were beams still left in the dismantled cottages near the church what if we got one and used it as a battering ram against the door the thought leaped through me like the fire leaping out of the shattered skylight i appealed to the man who had spoken first of the fire engine in the town have you got any pickaxes handy yes they had and a hatchet and a saw and a bit of rope yes 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 i ran down among the villagers with the lantern in my hand five shillings apiece to every man who helps me they started into life at the words that ravenous second hunger of poverty the hunger for money roused them into tumult and activity in a moment two of you for more lanterns if you have them two of you for the pickaxes and the tools the rest after me to find the beam they cheered with the shrill starveling voices they cheered the women and the children fled back on either side we rushed in a body down the churchyard path to the first empty cottage not a man was left behind but the clerk the poor old clerk standing on the flat tombstones sobbing and wailing over the church the servant was still at my heels his white helpless panic-stricken face was close over my shoulder as we pushed into the cottage there were rafters from the torn-down floor above lying loose on the ground but they were too light a beam ran across over our heads but it was out of reach of our arms and our pickaxes a beam fast at each end in the ruined wall with ceiling and flooring all ripped away and a great gap at the roof above open to the sky we attacked the beam at both ends at once god how it held how the brick and mortar of the wall resisted us we struck and tugged and tore the beam gave at one end it came down with a lump of brickwork after it there was a scream from all the women all huddled in the doorway to look at us a shout from the men two of them down but not hurt another tug all together and the beam was loose at both ends we raised it and gave the word to clear the doorway now for the work now for the rush at the door there is the light streaming into the sky streaming brighter than ever to light us steady along the churchyard path steady with the beam for the rush at the door one two three and off out rings the cheering again irrepressibly we have shaken it already the hinges must give if the lock won't another run with the beam one two three and off it's loose and the steady fire darts at us through the crevice all around it another and a last rush the door falls in with a crash a great hush of awe a stillness of breathless expectation possesses every living soul of us we look for the body the scorching heat on our faces drives us back we see nothing above below all through the room we see nothing but a sheet of living fire where is he whispered the servant staring vacantly at the flames he's dust and ashes said the clerk and the books are dust and ashes and oh sirs the church will be dust and ashes soon those were the only two who spoke when they were silent again nothing stirred in the stillness but the bubble and crackle of the flames hark a harsh rattling sound in the distance then the hollow beat of horses hoofs at full gallop then the low roar the all predominant tumult of hundreds of human voices clamoring and shouting together the engine at last the people around me all turned from the fire and ran eagerly to the brow of the hill the old clerk tried to go with the rest but his strength was exhausted i saw him holding by one of the tombstones save the church he cried out faintly as if the fireman could hear him already save the church 
the only man who never moved was the servant. There he stood, his eyes fastened on the flames, in a changeless, vacant stare. I spoke to him. I shook him by the arm. He was past rousing. He only whispered once more, Where is he? In ten minutes the engine was in position. The well at the back of the church was feeding it, and the hose was carried to the doorway of the vestry. If help had been wanted from me, I could not have afforded it now. My energy of will was gone, my strength was exhausted, the turmoil of my thoughts was fearfully and suddenly stilled. Now I knew that he was dead. I stood, useless and helpless, looking, looking, looking into the burning room. I saw the fire slowly conquered, the brightness of the glare faded, the steam rose in white clouds, and the smouldering heaps of embers showed red and black through it on the floor. There was a pause, then an advance altogether of the firemen and the police which blocked up the doorway, then a consultation in low voices, and then two men were detached from the rest and sent out of the churchyard through the crowd. The crowd drew back on either side in dead silence to let them pass. After a while a great shudder ran through the people, and the living lane widened slowly. The men came back along it with a door from one of the empty houses. They carried it to the vestry and went in. The police closed again round the doorway. The men stole out from among the crowd by twos and threes and stood behind them to be the first to see. Others waited near to be the first to hear. The women and children were among these last. The tidings from the vestry began to flow out among the crowd. They dropped slowly from mouth to mouth until they reached the place where I was standing. I heard the questions and answers repeated again and again, in low, eager tones all around me. Have they found him? Yes. Where? Against the door. On his face. Which door? The door that goes into the church. His head was against it. He was down on his face. Is his face burnt? No. Yes, it is. No, scorch not burnt. He lay on his face, I tell you. Who was he? A lord, they say. No, not a lord. Sir something. Sir means knight. And baronite, too. No. Yes, it does. What do you want in there? No good. You may depend on it. Did he do it on purpose? Burn himself on purpose? I don't mean himself. I mean the vestry. Is he dreadful to look at? Dreadful. Not about the face, though. No, no, not much about the face. Don't anybody know him? There's a man says he does. Who? A servant, they say. But he's struck stupid-like, and the police don't believe him. Don't anybody else know he is? Hush! The loud, clear voice of a man in authority silenced the low hum of talking all around me in an instant. Where is the gentleman who tried to save him? said the voice. Here, sir, here he is. Dozens of eager faces pressed about me. Dozens of eager arms parted the crowd. The man in authority came up to me with a lantern in his hand. This way, sir, if you please, he said quietly. I was unable to speak to him. I was unable to resist him when he took my arm. I tried to say that I had never seen the dead man in his lifetime, that there was no hope of identifying him by means of a stranger like me. But the words failed my lips. I was faint and silent and helpless. Do you know him, sir? I was standing inside the circle of men. Three of them opposite to me were holding lanterns low down to the ground. Their eyes and the eyes of all the rest were fixed silently and expectantly on my face. I knew what was at my feet. I knew why they were holding the lantern so close to the ground. Can you identify him, sir? My eyes dropped slowly. At first I saw nothing under them but coarse canvas cloth. The dripping of the rain on it was audible in the dreadful silence. I looked up along the cloth, and there at the end, stark and grim and black in the yellow light, there was his dead face. So, for the first and last time, I saw him. So, the visitation of God ruled it that he and I should meet. End of track 31